Okay, here starts the second part of the night face up. We are picking up at the top of page 148, and we are in the middle of um, the character still in the, um, thinking that he's in the uh, hospital in the modern day, recuperating from the motorcycle accident. And remember, we're going to be marking the paragraphs where he's switching back and forth between modern day and the ancient Aztec time where he's uh, fighting, chasing, running away for his life from the Aztec priests who were trying to use him as a human sacrifice and cut out his heart. Okay, top of 148. He could now make out the different shapes in the ward, the 30 beds, the closets with glass doors. He guessed that his fever was down. His face felt cool. The cut over the eyebrow barely hurt at all, like a recollection. He saw himself leaving the hotel again, wheeling out the cycle. Who'd have thought that it would end like this? He tried to fix the moment of the accident exactly, and it got him very angry to notice that there was a void there, an emptiness he could not manage to fill. Between the impact and the moment that they picked him up off the pavement, the passing out or what went on, there was nothing he could see, and at the same time he had the feeling that this void, this nothingness, had lasted an eternity. No, not even time, more as if, in this void, he had passed across something or had run back immense distances. The shock, the brutal dashing against the pavement. Anyway, he had felt an immense relief in coming out of the black pit where the people were lifting him off the ground. With pain in the broken arm, blood from the split eyebrow, contusion on the knee, with all that, a relief in returning to daylight, to the day, and to feel sustained and attended that was weird. Someday he'd ask the doctor at the office about that. Now sleep began to take over again, to pull him slowly down. The <coughs> that is my dog barking, I apologize. The pillow was so soft and the coolness of the mineral water in his fevered throat. The violet light of the lamp up there was beginning to get dimmer and dimmer. Now, let's see if paragraph 15 proves us right. Every time he falls asleep, he seems to shift over into whichever the other world is. So paragraph 15, as he was sleeping on his back, the position in which he came to did not surprise him. But on the other hand, the damp smell, there's one hint, the smell of oozing rock, there's another hint, blocked his throat and forced him to understand. Open the eyes and look in all directions, hopeless. He was surrounded by an absolute darkness, tried to get up and felt ropes pinning his wrist and ankles. He was staked to the ground on a floor of dank, icy stone slabs. The cold bit into his naked back, his legs. Dully, he tried to touch the amulet with his chin and found they had stripped him of it. Now he was lost. No prayer could save him from the final... From afar off, as though filtering through the rock of the dungeon, he heard the great kettle drums of the feast. They had carried him to the temple. He was in the underground cells of Teokali itself, awaiting his turn. All right, so if you haven't already, let's circle paragraph 15, the, the number 15 there, or however you've been marking it. And what I started doing was putting an A next to it for Aztec. And then I think what I did for modern... Oh, I put an H for hospital next to the other ones. So you don't have to flip back right now, but when you're answering questions later, we can flip back and do that. So at 15, uh, circle it or highlight it or whatever you do. And I've been marking it with an A for Aztec, or you could spell out Aztec if you want. All right, paragraph 16. He heard a yell, a hoarse yell that rocked off the walls. Another yell ending in a moan. It was he who was screaming in the darkness. He was screaming because he was alive. His whole body with that cry fended off what was coming, the inevitable end. He thought of his friends filling up the other dungeons and of those already walking up the stairs of the sacrifice. He uttered another choked cry. He could barely open his mouth. His jaws were twisted back as if with a rope and a stick. And once in a while they would open slowly with an endless exertion as if they were made of rubber. The creaking of the wooden latches jolted him like a whip. Rent, writhing, he fought to rid himself of the cords sinking into his flesh. His right arm, the strongest, strained until the pain became unbearable and he had to give up. Page 149. He watched the double door open and the smell of the torches reached him before the light did. Barely girdled by the ceremonial loincloths, the priest's acolytes moved in his direction, 
looked at him with contempt. Lights were reflected off the sweaty torsos and off the black hair dressed with feathers. The cords went slack, and in their place the grappling of hot hands hard as bronze. He felt himself lifted still face up and jerked along by the four acolytes who carried him down the passageway. The torchbearers went ahead, instinctively lighting up the corridor with its dripping walls and a ceiling so low that the acolytes had to duck their heads. Now they were taking him out. Taking him out was the end. Face up under a mile of living rock, which, for a succession of moments, was lit up by a glimmer of torchlight. When the stars came out up there instead of the roof, and the great terrace steps rose before him, on fire with cries and dances, it would be the end. The passage was never going to end, but now it was beginning to end. He would see suddenly the open sky full of stars, but not yet. They trundled him along endlessly in the red, reddish shadow, hauling him roughly along, and he did not want that. But how to stop it? They had torn off the amulet, his real heart, the life center. I don't know if you noticed, but these sentences are really long. This paragraph is really long, and they keep repeating things like the end. Um, so I feel like the story is rapidly... Uh, and yeah, as you turn the page, here's the last page of the story. All right, page 150. In a single jump, he came out into the hospital night. Okay, so uh, mark paragraph 17, and I marked it with an H for hospital. In a single jump, he came out into the hospital night, to the high, gentle, bare ceiling, to the soft shadow wrapping him round. He thought he must have cried out, but his neighbors were peacefully snoring. The water in the bottle on the night table was somewhat bubbly, a translucent shape against the dark azure shadow of the windows. He panted, looking for some relief for his lungs, oblivion for those images still glued to his eyelids. Each time he shut his eyes, he saw them take shape instantly, and he sat up, completely wrung out, but savoring at the same time the surety that now he was awake, that the night nurse would answer if he rang, that soon it would be daybreak with the good deep sleep he usually had at that hour, no images, no nothing. It was difficult to keep his eyes open, the drowsiness was more powerful than he. He made one last effort. He sketched a gesture toward the bottle of water with his good hand and did not manage to reach it. His fingers closed again on a black emptiness and the passageway went on endlessly rock after rock. Okay, here is the first time that we have not a new paragraph, um, but him shifting to the ancient Aztec time uh, in the middle of a paragraph and we are going to find out whether it's the hospital time that is his reality or the Aztec time. So I'm not sure if you can catch it now or you may have to go back and reread. But we are, I don't know, like almost halfway down this page. Um, and you'll see the word emptiness right on the left hand side. That's where I marked with an A. Um, so in the middle of this long paragraph is where we have this shift. So I'm going to pick up there at emptiness. Emptiness and the passageway went on endlessly, rock after rock, with momentary ruddy flares. And face up, he choked out a dull moan because the roof was about to end. It rose, was opening like a mouth of shadow, and the acolytes straightened up. And from on high, a waning moon fell on a face whose eyes wanted not to see it, were closing and opening desperately, trying to pass to the other side to find again the bare protecting ceiling of the ward. And every time they opened, it was night and the moon, while they climbed the great terrace steps, his head hanging down backward now, and up at the top were the bonfires, red columns of perfumed smoke, and suddenly he saw the red stone shiny with the blood dripping off it, and the spinning arcs cut by the feet of the victim, whom they pulled off to throw him rolling down the north steps. With a last hope, he shut his lids tightly, moaning to wake up. For a second, he thought he had gotten there, because once more he was immobile, in the bed, except that his head was hanging down off it, swinging, but he smelled death, and when he opened his eyes, he saw the blood-soaked figure of the executioner priest coming toward him with a stone knife in his hand. He managed to close his eyelids again, although he knew now he was not going to wake up, that he was awake, that the marvelous dream had been the other, absurd as all dreams are. A dream in which he was going through the strange avenues of an astonishing city with green and red lights that burned without fire or smoke, 
on an enormous metal insect that whirred away between his legs. In the infinite lie of the dream, they had also picked him off the ground. Someone had approached him also with a knife in his hand, approached him who was lying face up, face up with his eyes closed between the bonfires on the steps. So which one of the parallel plots was real? The Aztec one or the hospital one? And towards the end there, he says that there was two worlds where somebody was approaching him with a knife. So who was approaching him with a knife in the hospital world? And who was approaching him with a knife in the Aztec world? And I will stop the recording now so we can discuss.